My name is Cal. Uh, I'll be taking you guys through the probability seminar today. Thank you so much for coming out so early in this horrible weather. Um, but for the next hour and 20 minutes, our goal is to just go from the ground up, rebuild probability, uh, just kind of touch up on your foundation, things that you might have learned in year 11 uh, that still could be assessed in year 12. So, I mean, we might not actively be studying those things, but maybe in this next hour or so, you guys might be able to learn something or relearn some things, right? Remi be reminded of a couple of these ideas. Um, now, the topic itself, probability, needs no introduction. Like I said, I just want you guys to copy a lot of this down. With what we do today, for probability, the thing that I want you guys to stay away from is just try not to do too much of it in your head and try to just articulate your working out. Right? And this is why we have this nice little key here. A lot of this stuff we will be using, or you guys will see. Um, and so the more, I guess, the more notation that you guys have in your up your sleeve, I guess, um, the easier it is for you guys to, to start writing or to start your working out, just so that all of that work isn't in your head and your answer at the end isn't just a fraction, right? Which we'll try to stay away from today. Now we'll start, like I said, from the ground up, um, and we'll start with the most basic. So let's get into it. The thing is, when we go through the whole topic of probability today, hopefully you guys get a better grasp of the overall idea as well. So it's not just like probability is that topic where you deal with stuff. It's more broken down just like how you guys would understand other, other modules or other topics like that, right? So the first type of question that we go through or the first type of question you ever learned, right? I don't know, maybe in year eight or year nine or whatever it is, is you have a single event, right? And you wanna calculate the probability of just one outcome. Very straightforward, that's the first question. Um, and so in this case, very standard. I'm sure some of you guys might have even read this ahead and just done it in your head. But in this case, can I have you guys just do this? So the first one, actually, I'll do the first one. You guys do the second one, right? And so, in this case, Brian owns eight white cats, three black cats, and two brown, um, and one of them escapes. So first of all, that's our event, that's the, the cat escaping, right? And the outcome that we want to look for is, which cat is this? Yeah. And so, in the first one, they're asking, hey, can you calculate the probability of, of that, that white cat, right? Or it, the, the cat escaping being white. And so we just need to make sure we use the right formula. All of that stuff is right up ahead, right, right before the question. So having a white cat, there are eight white cats, right? So those are the possible outcomes that I want. And then over the total possible outcomes, which would be eight plus two plus three. Um, so just eight on 13. Is that all right with everyone? Straightforward, yeah. And then the next part, or the next bit of, uh, the next formula right underneath that is the complementary events, right? So when I have, uh, if, if they ever ask you for not something, right? So in this case, what is the probability of not getting a black cat? Now, it might not seem uh, useful at first. It seems quite trivial, right? You can do a lot of this in your head. But like I said, having a good foundation when we build into and scale up to the harder questions makes it a little easier. So in this case, probability of, um, probability of not a black cat. So this, I'm sure, is what everyone's been thinking. Yeah, very straightforward. Everyone's got this down. Yeah, is everyone okay with this? For this, just, just give me a slight nod. I know, I know it's, it's kind of hard for us to speak up. Just a little nod, just so I can have that confirmation. Perfect, cool. So in this case, probability of white cat, eight on 13. Probability of not a black cat is one minus the probability of a black cat. Very straightforward. Yeah. Um, any, any questions so far? Should be fine, right? So this is at the lowest level, the type of probability questions we'll have. Yeah. When we start to scale up, I guess, uh, I want to give you guys a bit of direction. Yeah? Where do we actually go from here? So, you have a single event, you have, you're asked for a single outcome. When we move into harder questions, you have a single event, but then they ask you for the probability of multiple outcomes. Hey, what's the probability of, like in this case, right? In this case. So, in question, in question two, what you guys can see is you have, once again, an event, right? In this event, we have uh, a book being taken out, right, at random, and the probability or the outcome that you're looking for, in this case, is odd or below five, right? So multiple outcomes in this case. Can everyone see how we've scaled from, from the previous type now, yeah? So instead of just looking for the probability of one type, I need to scale it up to two types, yeah? Or, or I guess two outcomes. And so the natural progression for me, I'm sure everyone knows this is, oh yeah, you know, if I want the probability of odd or less than five, right? I just need to make sure I find the individual probabilities, I add them together. Is that all right with everyone so far? Yeah, straightforward, yeah. The only problem here is once I start to actually calculate, you know, the sample space and, and list everything out, I notice that I might have double counted. Can everyone see that? Yeah. So when I start to look at, all right, what are the odd numbers? One through uh, one, three, five, six, nine. And then what are the numbers less than five? One through to four, right? You might notice that there are some here that have been double counted. So in this case, if I just add these two together, nine on 10, that's not gonna be the case, or that's not really gonna get you the answer, right? And the problem here, 
right? The problem here is we need to account for the fact that some of these possibilities can occur at the same time. Yeah? And that's the key of this first section. So when you consider multiple outcomes, right, you need to make sure that you understand, can these outcomes occur together? Right? Because if they can occur together, we run across this problem. Yeah? We can't just add them together. So I want to fix that top, that top formula. Right? We're not just going to add them together. We need to correct the probability. So we add them together. We just need to minus anything that we've double counted. Does that make sense? Yeah. So in this case, very straightforward, right? We're taking this step by step. And so anytime you come across a scenario where you're given a, an event, and you need to calculate the, the outcomes. You need to make sure, are these outcomes or can these outcomes occur together? Or can they occur at the same time? Yeah? If they can, then we need to make sure that we correct the probability. So correcting the probability is just making sure we minus away anything that we've overcounted. And I guess visually speaking, the way that we represent this on your sheet, right, you can see Venn diagram from like what, year eight, year nine, yeah? So the Venn diagram is the perfect tool to visualize what we're dealing with here, yeah? So anytime you need to deal with multiple outcomes, the Venn diagram is just perfect. Yeah? Um, I have an example of the Venn diagram, or we'll go through this, and we'll use the Venn diagram in this case. Don't worry too much about the title, mutually exclusive, non-mutually exclusive. I know that's, that's a mouthful, right? We'll come back and we'll annotate what that really is in a second. But for now, let's go through this question. Yeah. The way that we, we, we kind of see this coming, or one of the, the, uh, the pointers that you guys might notice when doing these questions, if, uh, if you're dealing with non-mutually exclusive or mutually exclusive or events that can happen at the same time is when you look at the possible outcomes, all the possible outcomes, you add them together and there's some kind of discrepancy. If I take 17, 11 and 3, add them together, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna have, um, I'm not going to have 25, I'm going to have more than that. So we've overcounted in that sense. Yeah. So here I have 25 students, yeah? 17 like chocolate milk, 11 like strawberry, and then 3 like neither. Um, and in this case, like I said, we want to implement the Venn diagram. It makes it, takes a lot of that thinking from your brain to the paper. Yeah. So I'll give you guys a second, right? You guys have the Venn diagram there. I'm going to assume that you guys are okay with building a Venn diagram. Is everyone okay with building a Venn diagram? I'm sure it is. Everyone's here, yeah. I'll give you guys like a minute or 30 seconds, right, just to see if you can set out A and B, and I'll throw up the diagram, I'll throw up the solutions, and we'll go through in a second. Just very quickly draw a Venn diagram to try to represent, visualize, oh sorry, visualize the, uh, the information, and then, and then we'll go through it. So in your Venn diagram, you have two circles, right? Two circles will represent your multiple outcomes. Question, oh, question three, girls. Let's wrap that up, right? Approach. I'm sh I, I see everyone just like punching it in the calculator, right? I'll start to, ooh, a little bit of a spoiler, sorry. Um, but we want to build our Venn diagram first, right? I know this is a bit trivial. Like I said though, when the questions get harder, if you know your foundation, it makes it a lot easier to tackle these other questions, right? So we're starting slow. In this case, I have a Venn diagram. I know the diagram in your sheet doesn't have a box around, right? It's good to have your box around just so when you're doing that, that working out, if you're writing this in an exam, the marker can differentiate between a floating random number on your sheet and, and a number that actually relates to your Venn diagram. Yeah. So in this case, strawberry, chocolate, everyone's cool with that. Yeah? In the middle section is where the, the students are, or in the middle section would be representing the students that like both, right? Strawberry and chocolate. So in this case, to actually calculate, or well, the first step would be to calculate how many is it that we've overcounted, or how many belong in this overlapping section to just verbalize it, though, just to make sure that we know what's going on. That middle section is students are like chocolate, right? And strawberry. Yeah. So this is the notation coming back in, yeah? the ones that I had you guys write from before. Just remember, this little, uh, this little cap looks like an A, yeah? and, and then the other one, if you remember this as and, whatever the other one is, will be or. Yeah? Very straightforward in that sense. So strawberry, chocolate, in the middle, strawberry and chocolate, right? So six is what you probably calculated. Make sure that you guys just add it together. Yeah, six. Oh, awesome. 
And then when you're filling in the rest of your Venn diagram, just make sure that you subtract it out and you count them properly. Yeah? We've already accounted for six of the students in the middle, so just make sure, uh, yeah, make sure that you guys have the correct numbers. And once you guys have the diagram out, calculating any other probability is just a matter of reading off numbers. Yeah? That's really the, the reason why we go through these tools. Yeah? This is the first tool. Yes. Everyone okay with that? Neither sits outside. Straightforward. Yeah. Any questions? Now with part B, they ask for um, probability of the students, uh, what is it? Probability of students that like chocolate or strawberry. Yeah. So or, in this case, we're taking the union or, or or is we're taking anyone that like strawberry, strawberry and chocolate, chocolate, right? So we just need to make sure we have all the students in the middle. But one, way to, one way to go about this is just using the addition rule, right? So we add them together and then we just make sure we account for the, uh, or we correct the probability, account for the overlap. Literally what we did in the previous question. Give you guys a second, just sort that out. So, moving on to the next question, or actually, let's take a moment for a second and go back to the title, of the, I guess the heading of this little section. So this, this part that we went through, non-mutually exclusive, right? We dealt with outcomes that can occur together. They can occur at the same time, and we made sure that we accounted for that overlapping. Yeah. So, next to the heading, if I can have you guys, next to the heading, it says non-mutually exclusive. Such a technical word. All I want you guys to do in brackets left to it is just, the, also, sorry, to the right of it, is just right can occur together, right? That's it. So because they can occur together, right, we need to make sure that we account for that overlapping end of story. And so when you flip the page, I feel like it's quite a, quite logical why we move to the next step, yeah? So on the next, on the next part, we have mutually exclusive events. I mean, if non-mutually exclusive is when they can occur together, mutually exclusive is when they can't occur together, yeah? And your life is a lot easier when you're dealing with questions uh, of this kind, yeah? You see that your Venn diagram is very straightforward. In this case, to demonstrate the idea, right? I have here Tronga Zoo, houses five kangaroos, nine emus, three wombats, and if one of these guys escapes, what's the probability of, of it being an emu or a wombat, yeah? And in this case, like I said, your life is a lot easier because realistically, the animal that escaped cannot be an emu and a wombat at the same time. That's the Pokemon generator. I fused two guys together. I used the, I used Sandshrew. It was the closest thing I got. But you guys get the idea, right? That's not possible. You can't have these two things together. So taking this scenario, I understand that these events are, I want to use the technical words, mutually exclusive. They cannot occur together. So we don't need to correct for any of that probability. We're not overcounting. Yeah? And visually speaking, right, using the Venn diagrams, your Venn diagram becomes even easier. You literally just have two circles, yeah? They cannot occur together. End of story. Anyone have any questions on that? So the next one I want you guys to do on your own, which will take literally a second. In this case, so, I mean, if we follow the rule that I set out, right, that addition rule, just the addition rule, just fancy for saying literally adding things together, right? When you correct for that probability, it will just be zero, yeah? Because you don't need to correct for it. That's it. So the next question I want you guys to do is just have on your own, oh yeah, right? Emu, wombat, visually speaking. Is everyone okay with that? Yeah? Cool. Now, this one, have you guys have a crack at this? It's like, we'll, take, we'll be very quick, yeah? Like I said, in independent questions, you're just looking at, oh, you're just actually just adding them together, yeah? One to one. Don't need to worry about anything. Because in this case, right, the marble that you pick out can't be bow, green, and purple at the same time, or whatever color it is. Or can it? In this case, in these types of questions, the Venn diagram is not necessary. Yeah. The Venn diagram was there just to kind of show you contrast 
for you guys the difference between the two types of questions, mutually exclusive, non-mutually exclusive. I'm gonna try my best not to use those words, they're just so many syllables. We'll just say, can the events happen at the same time, together, or can they not happen at the same time, or together? Right? So in this case, they can't. Our answers, oh, I remember this? Don't worry. <laughs> so we have, very straightforward, just adding it, right? Just probability of one, add to the probability of other one. And then we also have, uh, just coming back to the complementary events, one minus. No, nothing, uh, nothing tricky there. Everyone's cool. And the final one, just making sure you guys understand, you can scale this to however many you want, right? You can continue to add however many outcomes you want. It's multiple outcomes, not just two. Yeah, we're just dealing with many uh, in one go. So that's really it, right? So for the first really fundamental bottom layer of probability, that's all we have, right? So the way that I, I try to kind of break this down for us is just, that's probability, right? And then you have questions dealing with single events. And in the single events, the first type of question that we dealt with was just like single outcomes. Hey, what's the probability of this happening? End of story. And then we went to, hey, you have that single event, right? What's the probability of uh, many of these things, or many of these outcomes? The probability of A and B, or A or B. And you're taking in uh, different, different outcomes, you need to combine them. And that's when we had, or that's when we needed to categorize these events. It's like, are they uh, mutually exclusive or whatever it is? Or really, are these outcomes, can they occur together? Can they not occur together? And then that kind of dictates how you're gonna be calculating these things. Yeah? But that's really the first stage. Moving into the next one though, right? As the probability scales up for two unit students, this is where most of your HSE questions will lie. Yeah? Multi-stage events. Yeah. So multi-stage events is just literally taking the single event and then you have many parts to it. And so the best tool, just like in this case, right? Your best tool or your best friend is the Venn diagram. In the multi-stage events, your best friend is, does anyone know? Tree diagram. The tree diagram, right? It's, it's something that I want you guys to always revert to, yeah? Just so you have some kind of safety net. If you're lost, if you read a question and you're just, you know, frozen in, in I guess, shocked, it's like, oh my God, what is going on? You have something to fall back to, that's the tree diagram. Always go back to your tree diagram. In this case here, I have a multi-stage event. Two stages, very straightforward, yeah? In the first stage, I have the possibility of A happening, then B, and then A happening, and then B, right? It occurs twice, very straightforward. Um, I guess we'll quickly run through the techniques, right? The technicalities of the tree diagram. Going down the branches, we need to make sure we multiply. Everyone's cool with that. Yeah? To get the probability of A and A happening, we take the probability of A, multiply the probability of A, right? So you follow the branches through and you multiply the probabilities together. If you need to take multiple outcomes, ah, see that? Come back to what we just did. If I need to take multiple outcomes, right? Meaning if I have to take many of these possibilities, same thing as before, we add them together. Yeah. So this is just separating, when is, it, when is it that I must add things together? When is it that I must multiply things together? Is everyone okay with that? Yeah? So, let's actually apply this. Oh, and I guess this is just the, my way of saying, this is one possibility, yeah? one possibility uh, of occurring. And if I need to take multiple possibilities, you add them together. Kind of like one timeline, essentially. Okay, cool. So, first question. Um, first question. <laughs> so a die is rolled, yeah, twice. Um, but in this case, in this case, twice is, is the multi-stage event. Yeah, it happens twice, so we're doing it uh, first time, second time. And so what is the probability that it lands on four twice, right? So these are the three parts that I want, before you guys do anything though, right? Like I said, anytime it's a multi-stage event, I know this is easy, we like to draw a tree diagram. I wanna show you guys though, just because uh, I feel like there is <coughs> slightly an art form that some of us know about drawing tree diagrams, just to save us time. In this case, they're asking for us, I know a die has six, six sides, right? And if you really draw out the whole tree diagram, it's gonna take years. So in this case, part A is really asking for Four. They're asking for phase four, right? So when you draw your tree diagram, you can just save yourself a lot of time. I don't know what the five's gonna mean. Um, you can save yourself a lot of time just by simplifying what you actually need, yeah? So in this case, for part A, I only need four, and that's it. Anything beyond that is just not four. We can consider it not four. You will save a lot of time by doing this. You just need to make sure you adjust your probabilities. Okay? So this tree diagram, what is it? Significantly, it takes significantly less time, right? I just wanna, kind of show you guys the way of doing that. Yeah. Just makes it a little easier. And I'm sure some of us are already on board with this technique, right? Four, not four. It's very common for one question, guys, for you to draw different probability tree diagrams, depending on what part of the question you're dealing with. In this part, 
If I want to get the probability of it getting four twice, I just need to follow the branch that is four twice, right? Multiply down, you get your probability at the end. One on six, one on six. Now what about for the next one though? The next one was, So the next one says, what about if it lands on a three and a five in any order? Yeah? So this is where we're kind of combining what we learned previously, or what we relearned re previously, the addition rule, right? We're taking multi-stage events, but looking at multiple outcomes. So in this case, right, how would you draw this? Now, I haven't completed the tree diagram, not because I'm lazy, but on purpose. Yeah? I feel like if you know what you're looking for, your tree diagram doesn't need to be complete. I'm looking for five and three. Yeah? Oh, by the way, sorry. In this case, because they're asking for five and three, those are the, the I guess, the, per, the people of interest, right? Or the uh, outcomes of interest, Mr. Five, Mr. Three. And then everything else I can just consider as neither, yeah? Does that make sense with everyone? This is just another way to simplify my diagram down. Now, notice, like I said, I didn't even complete this branch down here, because I know there's nothing down there for me. Yeah? I need three, I need five. And I know that can only happen in these two branches. So you can complete those branches, right? I think just a bit of foresight, a bit of planning saves you a lot of time in an exam where you might not have a lot of time yeah, if you're drawing these probability tree diagrams out. So in this case, to make sure that I get um, all the maths behind this, right? so that's very straightforward. Everyone's okay with that? 4-4. Yeah. Four, four. Now, anytime you guys see probability of an event and then they literally just write another event after that, that's just in succession. Yeah? So 4 happening first, then 4 happening right after. Yeah? We'll see this right here. Getting the probability of three and five in any order is obviously three, five, five, three, and you need to make sure you capture those branches. Yeah. So just going back to this guy. Calculate the correct branches, right, that you want, add them together, it should be fine. So, we have that. Yeah. And the final one though, the final one is honestly just a, a bit of a curveball, but it's a lot easier in that sense. Uh, it lands on an even number, then one, yeah? So in the question, they want an order, right? They want exactly even number first and then one, right? Actually, I'll give you guys a second to do C. I want you guys to just draw a probability tree diagram in the same fashion as we've done so far. The criteria in part C is even and then, and then one. And everything else in terms of outcome. really where two unit ends, and then we, we move across to three unit, discuss binomial probability. I feel like there's, it's not too, too much of a departure from the form. So, last, last part, right? Even, then a one, yeah? So we're not considering one, then even. They specifically want an even first, then a one. Just, I guess, through, a, through the grammar, right? We should be able to pick that up and just multiply the, the probability problem. Yeah. Everyone's cool with that? Now, one little, just small thing with these types of questions, a lot of times you're asked for the probability of at least one thing occurring, right? And so, what you'll notice is, like in this question, right? Oh, actually, no, this one's for you guys to just go on your own, right? Have a crack at this. It's literally the previous one, just so you guys have your own practice. So find the probability of getting a yellow and a black ball, where we're, we're taking two, we're taking two. So in this case, probability of getting a yellow ball, right? Probability of getting a black ball, 
calculate them individually, follow the branches down, combine them together, make sure you capture all the outcomes, you should be right. While you guys are wrapping that up, can I just say though, uh, there has been a common thread, right? This is under a certain heading in your sheet, and it is independent events. And I just want to bring our attention to that. Just like in when we were consider considering multiple outcomes, we had to take into account, right? We had to think about, okay, are these outcomes, do they relate to one another? We categorize that topic. Mutually exclusive, not mutually exclusive. When you're dealing with multi-stage events, there are things you need to consider as well. Yeah? And you need to consider, are these events independent or dependent? And I guess that's just a fancy way of saying, are the probabilities affected every time an event occurs, right? In all of these cases, would you guys agree, in all of these cases, All of the cases that we've gone through so far, the probability never changes, right, in succession. So if I, if I roll a die, right, if I roll a die the first time, the second time I roll that die, it's not going to change. Your probability does not change. Probability stays consistent throughout the whole probability tree. Yeah? And that is the same with everything that we've done so far, with the previous question that you guys just did, with this one as well, right? So the way that we see that is, in this case, if a ball is chosen at random, and then they put it back, right? We don't disturb the sample space, your, your uh, probability remains the same. And this is what we call independent. They are all independent of one another. Is everyone okay with that? Yeah? So obviously, independent, um, well actually before we move into dependent, right? Before we move into dependent, something that we'll actually come across quite often is a question where they'll use the word at least one, right? And so, in this case, three cards are sequentially picked. So we have a multi-stage event, we have three stages. Yeah? But then with replacement. So every time I take a card, right, I replace that card. Probability never changes. Yeah? And it says, what is the probability that at least one is an ace? Yeah. So at least one, if I interpret it properly, is I get one ace, or I get two aces, or I get three aces. Right? And in that case, you guys can just consider those three, and then just add those probabilities together. Does that make sense? I'm sure that's what everyone's thinking, right? But sometimes, right, what if this is like a... What if this is like a 10 stage event, right? Where it's not practical for you guys to consider, oh, what if, what if I get one ace, two aces, three aces, four, five, six, and you sit there just listing out these probabilities, right? The fast way around this is just going back to complementary events, right, and we're doing one minus. So at least one just refers to one minus never getting any, yeah? So if you find the probability of never getting an ace and you just find the complementary of that, right? You will find all the other possibilities of getting one ace, two aces, three aces, that captures everything in one go. Yeah. So that's just something that I need you guys to, or if you guys aren't already thinking about, anytime we see at least one, that's the first thing we do, or that's the first thing we think about. It's a way to save time. In this case, it's like, man, if I list it out, it's not that bad, but definitely when you go to binomial where things are a bit more hectic, right? It's, a lot easier to just do one minus than to find every single possibility. But so far, our definition is independent, probability never changes. And this is like a precursor to, for those who do three unit, four unit, right? This is a precursor to Binomial probability, that's what binomial probability is. Yeah. So binomial is just literally multi-stage events where the probability doesn't change, it stays consistent, you only have two probabilities that, that are in the system. Okay, so, quick review right, of everything that we've done, just to make sure we can compartmentalize all the topics, just so probability is not just one black box. Yeah. Single events, and then the, the tricky thing in single events is we had to consider multiple outcomes, and then the tool for that was the Venn diagram. When you move on to the other side, you have multi-stage events, right? Things occurring many times, and I guess the whole event happens over many stages. And then in that case, you need to make sure you're considering, hey, is this event um, independent or dependent? Are the probabilities being affected every time a stage has occurred, right? So, in that case, looking at something that is dependent, right? Part A and part B, not fully related, actually. No, that's fine. So here we have Ben has a Ben has a bag that contains five red beans and seven green beans. If he reaches in to grab a bean, what is the probability that it will be red? That's just a standard one, right? This is just setting up so that when we do C and D, you guys have the answer already and you're just combining it together. Yeah, so just do A and B for me, really quickly. No, actually just do A for me. Get the answer down so we have something. We'll do B together, right? In this case, the probability. 
is affected, right? So the first time I take a bean, the probability is whatever it is. But once I've taken that bean, the second time I go for it, my probabilities have changed. Or honestly, everything just decreases by one. Or most things decrease by one. That's what we'll see. So in part B, he says, given that he has grabbed a red bean, right? I've grabbed a red bean without replacement. It's not going to replace it. Systems change now. What is the probability that he will grab a green bean? Yeah. So obviously there are still seven green beans, but your total probability will be um, seven on eleven instead, right? We only have eleven total beans left. That's it. So the way that we, oh, the way that we annotate, or the way that we write this out, it's on your sheet, right? And uh, I'm not sure if we have. So in this case, that's the probability of it being red, right? And then. This is how we, I guess, annotate conditional probability. So the way that you'd read this out, anytime you see this vertical line, probability of picking a green bean, right? Given that a red bean has been picked, yeah? That's conditional probability. And so whenever you're dealing with dependent events, that's how you generally write things, yeah? This wasn't necessary previous to this because if it was independent, probability of green, given that it was red, would just be probability of green, right? It doesn't really change. So in this case, we do have to annotate that and we, we let them know, hey, we picked a red one out, so things have changed. That's why it's 7 on 11 and not 7 on 12. Yeah. So with the next part, it says, what is the probability that he grabs a red bean, then a green bean? Right? So once again, dependent events, we're still dealing with tree, tree diagrams. Yeah? I want you guys to draw a tree diagram out for this right? and go for, for part C. But understanding that the probability does change, you can't just fill out the probabilities as quickly. You just have to minus one every single time where necessary. Right? So we'll plow through this, but when we get to the uh, HSC questions, I'll give you guys a bit more time to actually process them and have a go, under, uh, go at it on your own. Right, the tree diagram that you guys draw out doesn't need to be completed. We're just looking for we're just looking for the red bean, then the green bean. Yeah. So find I guess you guys can draw out your red, and then obviously we want a green from this, right? But the probability that we have, obviously the first one is just probability of red because nothing's happened yet, so it has the the formal probability. But the next one you just need to make sure you annotate it correctly. Probability of green, given that red's occurred, right? Because things have changed a little bit. But we already have these two parts. Combine them together, get your final answer. Yeah. So the tree diagram, there's another level of sophistication in that sense, but it's very straightforward. Yeah, you just need to adjust the probabilities as you go, understanding that they, um, it's, uh, they affect one another. They are dependent as events. Now in the last one, if Ben reaches in to grab two beans at once, oh, so this is just a, a small thing. If you guys ever see questions where it's like, oh, two things happening at once, right? That's just succession, right? Same thing as succession, and you guys can treat it exactly like one after the other. Like a tree diagram, yeah. no dramas with that. So, with that last one, probability of red and green, you just treat it as if he's taking a red first, then a green, or green first, then a red, exactly like before. Yeah. Now the next one's a bit more difficult, um, because the data set's all mixed up. So the next one, I, I think you guys should actually have a go at, uh, go at it on your own. Tree diagrams, Probably will help, but just make sure you guys know what kind of criteria you're looking for. So when you draw your tree diagram, it's the information is appropriate to that part of the question. So, question 10. 34 men, 34 women. Oh, just a, a tip though. Just because we're dealing with men and women, and then they also tell us some of these men are married, some of these women are married and stuff like that. I know some of you guys might annotate it down to M and then M as well, right? M for married, M for men. Just change it to boy and girl, right? Just to make sure there's no confusion in that sense. So the probability of, say, a man would be 34 on whatever it is. So with this question, 34 men, 32 women at a party, right? So that's like one way of categorizing this data set. Moving on to the next bit, 13 of those men are married. 19 of the women are married. Oh, 
Also, a lot of times, if you guys have questions like this, it's probably best just to list out all the fundamental probabilities, right? The foundational probabilities. So, in this case, what's the probability of finding a man? And then, if you know that, probably just jot next to it. What's the probability of not finding a man, right? Finding a woman instead. And then you can start to form your probability tree diagram, and you can start just picking out the numbers that you need. So for the first one, both will be men. Straightforward, right? We're just dealing with gender in this case, so honestly just ignore the married part. Man, women, right? So 34 on, on 66, right? For men, but just make sure because once we've taken a, a man out, <coughs> your probabilities change, these events are dependent. And so you just need to adjust the probabilities with each stage. So if I want to form this, this tree diagram out, once again, I only need to draw one branch, right? I'm only looking for finding a man. Finding another man. And to just be as technical as possible. Probability of getting a man, right? And then the second time is probability of getting another man, given that a man has already been taken. That's it. So that's our conditional probability. No year 11's in here. So he's all. Oh, year 11. Um, yeah, this, I just need to now. Right. So you're on the new syllabus, just a warning, right? In yeah. the new syllabus, there is more of a focus in, in conditional probability. For the rest of us, we're cool. Yeah, you guys are cool. This really ends here. But for you, you're just going to have to... There is a bit more in this section, right? Yeah. Bayes' theorem and things like that. Mm -hmm. Just make sure you write it, revise it, because that's quite difficult. All right, cool. So one will be married, a married woman, sorry, and then the other one, an unmarried man. So in this case, right? In this case... Everyone's cool with that? Yeah? That will probably, like I said, a lot of this you guys do in your head, but just try not to. Yeah, just try not to. Just have a lot of this articulated out. Any marks you guys can get, uh, the better, right? So in this case, I'm, I'm sectioning everything out as girls and boys. Married girl, I want one married girl, right? Or we're using girl now, right? And then uh, an unmarried man or an unmarried boy, yeah? And just like before, right, we need to consider the fact that if I want these two, I can get them in, in, in different orders, right? So, married girl, unmarried, unmarried man, or unmarried man first, then a married girl. Yeah, so your tree diagram in this case, actually, why are you guys just getting any of that down? Yes, we can construct one of this. Married girl. Oh, yep. Yeah. You will the whiteboard in here. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yep. Yeah. Unmarried. combination of everything so we need to make sure that first line addition rule and everything like that right second line married girl and then you get an unmarried man so you want an unmarried man or boy sorry and then actually we're gonna need that guy and then So, in this case, I have not, this is not the complete tree diagram. You do not need the whole thing, right? We're only looking for the ones that we actually need, and that is these two combinations. Yeah. So once you have those two, make sure you guys have the right probability. So this guy is just probability of married girl. This is probability of married, unmarried, sorry, boy, given that you've taken the other one out. Yeah. So the probabilities, they just shift down by one. So we've already taken one person out of the system. Anyone have any issues with this? So like I said, one more time, that probability tree diagram is not complete, but I've only taken the branches that I need, right? If you really go on and draw the whole thing, it'll take you ages, right? And completely unnecessary. So just make sure you have the correct branches that you need. Sorry, and the last one. The last one, both will be married. So in this case, we're departing from men and women, right? We're just looking at married and uh, not married. So you guys just need to make sure you have, you've fixed your data, right? Or just look at it from a different perspective. Um, both married, yeah, married and married. So I guess the only way you can have that is married, then married, right? But when you go down the branch, right, it's the probability of the first guy being married, or first person actually, we're just considering men and women, 
right? First person being married, doesn't have to be conditional because that is the first event, nothing else has occurred at that time. But the second time we take something, right? Married, given that another person that has been married, or that is married, sorry, has been taken. So this is slightly different just because we need to account for the fact that your probabilities are changing. That's it. So, finally, right, just to kind of like put everything into perspective, independent, <coughs> your tree diagrams, they look exactly the same, your probabilities never change. This is where our probabilities would be affected every single stage after, yeah? Something happens, the next stage, everything decreases, right? Or you just need to account for the fact that the events affect each other. And then, like I said, not too much of a departure from the form. This is where two unit ends, and then this is where we just hop into three unit. Yeah, so binomial probability is really just looking at the same thing, and what you guys will find yourself dealing with is most binomial probability questions, literally like a, you roll a die 3,000 times or something like that, and you just gotta work with an event that's happening again and again and again. But luckily for us, luckily for us, all the events in binomial right, are independent. The reason for that is in binomial, guys, just a bit of revision. I know we don't have all the time to go through binomial theorem, but in binomial, you deal with the expansion of two terms, yeah? Binomial, two terms, yeah? And so in this case, if I work with a dependent event or dependent multi-stage event, you can see your probabilities, they change. You have more than just two terms, yeah? But luckily for us, right, luckily for us, we have independent cases. So cases like this, if I flip a coin, right? Probability never changes over however many stages. It's always half, 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 all the way down, yeah? And so if you're looking for the probabilities, these are, I guess, your, your end results. And I just wanna relate this back to your binomial theory, yeah? Very quickly. If I had to expand A plus B to the power of three, right? You guys all know how to do this, right? This is going back to binomial theorem, but your theorem allows you to capture the different combinations when you want to take three of these two terms, right? So A and B, if I had to create terms of three, there would be, I mean, the first one I can take is A, 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 no Bs, yeah? No, none of the Bs, take no Bs. And then the, another case is I'll take one B, and that's a different type of combination that I, that I can create. And then I can take two Bs, yeah? And then three Bs. And the coefficient to this would just be three C, zero, because you're taking no Bs, three C, one, you're taking that one B, and that combination term allows you to capture the different orders, yeah? Capture the different combinations. Three of them, and this will be 3C2, that's another three, and then 3C3, that's just one. And the same thing happens over here, right? So I guess when we're dealing with this type of probability, we realize we can use that mathematical model to capture, what if uh, I asked you guys, hey, what's the probability of getting two heads, right? Trivial in this case, because you literally can just count it off, but when I do this experiment, flipping a coin, 20 times, it is not trivial anymore. I guess in that case, non-trivial to actually list everything out and draw a probability tree diagram, yeah? Instead, we can use this mathematical model to capture all the combinations. So if I wanted two heads, I'll just find the, uh, I guess, head, head, tail, so on and so forth, right? And we can apply the formula in that case. So the first question, let's just get into it, right? A die is thrown 10 times, moving into binomial, right? What is the probability that it lands on exactly four, oh, sorry, on two exactly four times, right? Formula in this case, let's just break it down. Some of you guys already know this, but we have N, C, R, and then we have probability of the first thing happening, right? Usually we call this probability of success, and then the other one will just be Q, the probability of failure, right? Now, the way that this works is, if I want, I want it to land on two exactly four times, your R is what you want, so this is your four times, right? Your N is just going to be how many times you re repeat this experiment, right? In this case, 10 times. And then P and Q, you need to fill out your probabilities. Yeah. So instead of like the expansion of A plus B, right, to the N, really what we have here is just like an expansion, the equivalent of just probabilities, adding probabilities together, expanding, and then finding the different combinations, depending on what they're asking. Yeah. So in this case, we need to make sure that P is to the power of four. We want, we want, we want it to land on two, right, four times. So make sure that my probability there, there's four of them. And then whatever is left over in terms of the multi-stage event would be on Q. This is usually a 10 minus six to be specific. Yeah. Does everyone remember that, that formula? Everyone's okay with that, familiar, yeah? So, probability of it, of it landing on two, this is what P would be, if I were to annotate this, probability landing on two, which is straightforward, right? If I want it to occur four times, you'd agree that down the branch, this tree diagram, you'd multiply it four times to the power of four, 
obviously the probability doesn't change, we're dealing with independent events, right? And then two would just be, it happens four times, the last six times it can't be two, yeah? So whatever the complementary of P is, that's what Q is. And then we need to make sure this term, this term just essentially, right? This term just lays everything out and shuffles it back and forth, right? And it looks for all the different combinations. That's it, yeah? It shuffles it back and forth. Guys, there are questions out there where it won't always be this, yeah? It won't always be this. And we'll see this very soon. You just need to make sure you understand this term here, right? This term here shuffles everything so that we can find the combinations. And sometimes, some probabilities, they're fixed. They can't be shuffled around, yeah? So it can't just be like head, 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 tail, and just move the tail around everywhere. We'll go through the past paper question that actually deals with that in a second. So, that's binomial, back to this, right? Apply the formula. Some will find this a lot easier than the other probability because it relies less on intuition. More of a, a formula in this case, yeah? So it lands on a number less than three, exactly five times. Find, right? We just need two with this formula. We just need two. M minus R. We just need to make sure we find the individual terms and just combine them at the end. So, P will be the, the favourable outcome, which is probability of finding something less than three, yeah? individually speaking, just on that one chance. And I want it five times, yeah? so R will be five in this case. And then N is just the total number of times, right? in this case, how many times? It's still ten times, right? Total number of times the experiment is then repeated. And then obviously you have the complementary of this. Whatever that is, just one minus the original probability. So, kind of like implementing everything that we've done from the get-go. Yeah. Is that okay with that? Probability of, of it four times, yeah? Find the individual probability of one, one, one experiment, and then you just make sure you capture everything else. And then for the second one, five, same deal. Yeah, same deal. But like I said, this term here, guys, please just remember, there's only one bit of information you guys need to remember and it helps shuffle the probability around to make sure you capture all the different combinations. Yeah? All the different combinations on the probability tree. Why do I need this? Because no one's going to draw a 10 stage probability tree. Yeah? That's really where binomial expands to. In two units, you deal with only a few stages. Here, we deal with a gajillion stages. So, this one, okay. So, I, I'll give you guys a chance to do this one. Like I said, find the individual probabilities. Yeah? Find the individual probabilities and then just make sure you shuffle it around using the, the formula, right, to capture all the different combinations. So, while practicing basketball, right, James has a 15% chance of success. That's one probability. And then you're pretty much given stock standard, yeah, stock standard. But here is just to demonstrate the fact that we're using this to shuffle these around to find different combinations. So just punch it into your calculator, right? That's it. Now we don't have all the time today, so we will brush over perms and comms. It is very rarely seen in your HSC exams, right? Um, perms and comms, because it's taught in year 11, but it's one of those things that, that very rarely come up. On the other hand, probability as like a two unit topic even though taught in year 11 comes up quite often, there's always almost like one question per exam. But perms and comms very rare, and it is quite a, a lengthy topic. So we'll go through one question, right? But uh, if it's like, oh, what the hell's going on? It's more of just a reminder for you guys to, you know what, should, maybe I should read up on a bit of this stuff, just to freshen up before my exam. Okay, so, like I said, we'll get into hard binomial in, in a second with the HSC questions, but, oh. Everyone okay with this, right? Literally just find the individual probabilities. How many do I want? And then just make sure you adjust the numbers and you'll get your answer. Now, this, perms and comms. Yeah, I know we haven't done this in ages, but realistically, realistically, one in a million, right? It might pop up in your HSC exam. So here we have five cards are drawn. Five cards are drawn. And there's a favorable outcome. There's something that I'm looking for. I'm looking for, hey, what's the probability of of it being all the same suit. Yeah. 
give you guys a chance to just like get back into the mindset of permutations and combinations, right? I feel like you need to use like a certain part of your brain. But perms and comms is just a fancy way of counting things, and once you've counted everything, you can then combine it into a nice fraction and find your probability. The way that I guess most of us have learned, right? If you're picking five cards, you always give yourself like a nice little five slots, and then you fill in the numbers, and then it turns into factorials. Yeah. So, let's see. I want it from the same suit. Could I ask, if I want it from the same suit, how many possible cards can I pick from in that first card? Technically two ways to do this, right? Just very, very minor adjustments. Would you guys agree, my first card can be any of the 52? Actually, we'll start with just 13 at this point. So we'll start with 13, right? Because if I'm, I'm looking for the same suit, hearts, clubs, what it, whatever it is, right? There's 13 of them, yeah? And obviously the first card could be from that suit. And then, so let's say we're doing hearts. And we have hearts and 12, 11, 10. Obviously, as you pick these cards out, yeah, they start to decrease. Oh, if you really think about it, this is a multi-stage event, right? But where the, the probability is dependent. So where, where perms and comms is more of the dependent side of things, binomial, independent side of things, right? That's how they expand into your, your top topics. And this one's just going to be nine. And then we've got to take into account, hey, wait a second, you have four of these guys, and you can multiply that by four. Or quicker, quicker than that, you can just go, oh, my first card could be any of the 52. And you choose whatever, whatever suit that is, and it would just be 12, 11, 10, and nine, right? So first card could be any suit. If you pick a hearts, cool. If you pick a heart, then the next card has to be in the same suit. You only have 12 of those left, right? And that continues on. This is where you build your factorials from, right? Same thing, 4 times 13, 52. And this is our favorable outcomes. This will sit at the top of our probability. At the bottom of our probability, you have the total, prob the total outcomes, yeah? So if I have five cards and I'm not thinking about any kind of restriction, the total way of doing this is just 52, 51, 50, right? Uh, 49 and 48. And this just turns into, this just turns into, obviously, you know, it's, a bit, it's been a while, but that turns into uh, the, the notation, permutations, yeah? Is everyone okay with that? So like I said, if we're, we're a bit rusty on this, it's probably best. This question was, was here just so I could remind you guys, hey, this is a topic that uh, you could be asked on. Very rare, super, super rare, almost never asked about in year 12, but a uh, very real question. Beyond this, we're moving into the past paper questions, yeah? So, things will amp up a little bit. But like I said, I want you guys to just use as much notation as possible, just so you can take a lot of that thinking, right? Rely less on your intuition and articulate your working out. Just like anything in maths, you guys always need to make sure you're scabbing as many marks as possible. If you don't get the last answer, you know, however many steps, steps before that, you can get some marks for that. If you have no steps and your answer is always just one fraction, eight on 12, or 13 on 25, or whatever it is, very hard for you guys to actually capture these marks. So, first, first HC question. This one. I'll give everyone a second for this, actually. Whitney. Um, give everyone a moment for this. I want you guys to just do this on your own, right? See if you guys can just implement anything that we've learned so far. In this case, we do have a multi-stage event, just to kind of give you guys the hint. So we're drawing a tree diagram out for this. So give it a go, right? Again, if you guys have already done it, right? But we have two machines, they produce pens. It is known that 10% of the pens from machine A are faulty. So that's one fraction or one probability that you're given there. 5% of the pens produced by machine B are faulty. And then in part I, it's just one pen is chosen at random from each machine. What is the probability that at least one? At least one, right? Anytime I have at least one, I go for a certain, there's a certain tactic. I try not to just list out everything possible. Even though it's, it's you can do that here. Yeah. So it is a multi-stage event. Machine A, take a pen. In this case, guys, by the way, I'm just annotating A. A represents faulty in this case. A produces a faulty pen. And then dash on top of A's, A doesn't produce a faulty pen. You guys just have the complementary um, probabilities for this. Yeah. And going along the branch, you guys just need to find the one that is neither, right? So not getting faulty on both and just doing one minus. Instead of 
Like I said, it's, it's very simple in this case, but instead of finding all the other cases and adding them together, one minus that last guy. Yeah? So it would be something like that. So finding probability of, of it being not faulty, given that the machine is A, this notation's a bit extra, you don't really need it, right? But probability of uh, not faulty again, given that the machine is B. Yeah. And one minus that solves everything. Now for the second part though, for the second part, give you guys a second before I, before I show that. But it says, a coin is tossed. Yeah. How, does, how does the question change at this point? What are we really doing here? It is two marks, yeah? So like I said, in this case, there is a chance that you can get the answer wrong but still have some kind of marks for a tree diagram, yeah? That's why we wanna make, make sure we have as much working out as possible, taking all of that intuition, putting it onto the paper. So, in part B, we add another stage, I guess, right? So it's like, you're taking pens from machine A or B, but you're taking two pens, right? But then to pick which, which machine you, you take from, you just have a coin toss right at the beginning. So I guess if you really play this out, the story starts with a coin toss, yeah? And then you pick the pens from whatever machine you've, you've chosen, yeah? And then you pick another pen. So the tree diagram continues off the, the slide, but obviously, because I feel like you guys can complete it your, in, on your own, right? All you need to do is then add another stage to everything. I know it's not a one-to-one -one between A and B, or I and I, I, right? But we do add another stage, so we have half-half for the coin toss, right? Pick whatever machine it is, and then moving on to the actual, um, the actual faulty pens, right? One on 10, nine on 10. So with the, the final working out, once again, it looks very intense, right? But really, it's just uh, following tree diagrams, following the tree diagrams down. So this is probability of first getting machine A, which is the half coin toss, right? and then finding a faulty pen, or not a faulty pen, sorry, and then finding another non-faulty pen. And you do that for machine B as well, because the, pro the question itself asks, what is the probability that neither of them are faulty? Does anyone have any issues with this? So I guess it's standard, in a standard, in a standard case, you just have one machine. In this case, we have, uh, I guess, another layer to it, right? That's essentially it. So moving on to the next question. Oh, this one, ooh, this one's a bit different. Eight-sided die, the game is played by rolling the die until an eight appears on the uppermost face. So you just get eight on the top. I'd assume that's a, a one in eight chance, or probability. But that's the winning chance, yeah? But if I get the eight on top, I win. Obviously, if I get any of the others, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? Those other seven would just be the non-winning ones. And then what is the smallest value? Oh, I should, we'll go to there in a second. This is still two unit, right? So we're still doing two unit, we went back to two unit. This is definitely more involved. In the first part, they, they ask for a tree diagram. It makes your life a lot easier. If you don't do the tree diagram because it does say otherwise, you're then stuck there just explaining things, right, with words, which isn't always uh, the best. So it says, explain why the probability of the game ending before the fourth roll is. Ending before the fourth roll. They gotta always be extra like this, but before the fourth roll, ending on the third roll, yeah? So we just gotta imagine what's going on here. You can still draw your probability tree diagram for this as well. It just doesn't look the same as others because your game does end if you have one of the, the opportunities, right? So if I have, uh, I roll an eight and then I roll anything but an eight, this guy just ends here. You've won the game. But if I haven't rolled the eight yet, you can continue on, right? Roll the eight, haven't rolled the eight. And this, this goes on and on. And you guys can see how is it that we can build this little expression. If I want to win 
before the fourth roll. Meaning I could win in the first roll, the second roll, the third roll. My third roll is here. Eight. Not eight. Fill in my, my probabilities. One in eight chance of getting that eight, right? And then obviously everything else, seven and eight. One on eight. Seven and eight. One on eight. Follow the branches down. If I win in the first roll, right? If I win in the second roll, and the third one. And that is, or those would be the cases that we need to address if we want to win before the fourth. Right? And so if you find the probabilities of that and you list everything out, you can say, oh, therefore, you know, the one on eight is if you win in the first roll, seven on eight, one on eight, that's when you win on the second roll, meaning you've lost the first one. And then the third one is seven on eight squared, right? Lose twice, win the third one. So in this next one, what is the smallest value of n for which the probability... This is... We are moving away from, from probability in this case. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you guys a go at this. We want the probability no more... What is it? Ending before the nth roll is more than... Oh, we want it more than 3 or 4. How many times do I have to roll it so that the probability becomes greater than 3 or 4? Now in part I, I, you want to expand from what you've learned in part I. So essentially you've, you've established some part of an expression, some part of a series, and you want to just expand that so that you move on to, or you generalize it to n cases. Yeah. So you roll it to n amounts. You just need to make sure you know where you end in this case. Yeah. So I think that the little trick here that might help, or just save you a lot of time is, if I end before the fourth roll, yeah. well I guess we want to establish the series first. Yeah. Your series looks like this. 1 on 8, and then I guess the next term is 7 on 8 times that 1 on 8, the next term is Two of those seven on eights, and obviously the next one will be three seven on eights, four, five, six, seven, eight, so on and so forth, right? So if I just write just a longer expression to give me give myself a bit more context. One on eight, and then the next one will be seven on eight. Times one on eight. Squared. Cubed. I want to get to the nth one. I just need to make sure I know, what's that last one though? What should that last one be? The question itself does not change though, right? So the previous one is, I want it to end before the fourth roll. And notice that my seven on eight ends at two, yeah. or ends at the square. And then in this case, if it's n rolls, if it's n rolls, what should my last term be? So if I want to end before n rolls, what, what would this one be? Like I said, you want to just expand from what you already know, right? In part i, that is. And what I already know is, what I already know is that if I want to end before the fourth roll, my seven on eight term goes to two. Yeah. Really, it's because you want to end on the third game. And if you end on the third game, you only lose twice. Yeah. So if I want to end before n rolls, that means I want to win on the n minus one roll, right? Meaning I have to lose how many times? I'll have to lose, you have to, I guess, minus that again, n minus two. Does that make sense for everyone? Yeah. So with the fourth roll, win before the fourth roll, roll, meaning I win on the third one, right? If I win on the third one, I have to lose twice. Yeah. It's the only way. And so if I want to win before n times, I have to win on the n minus one term, right? If I win on that term, then I have to lose n minus two times, one less than that. That's essentially it. And so once you build your expression, I feel like the first thing we could probably do is just factorize the one on eight out, make your life a lot easier in that case. It will just be one, seven on eight, right? Seven on eight squared, all the way to seven on eight, n minus two. Yeah. And then from here, this is where we just move away from probability. This is just a geometric series, yeah? What's our common ratio here? Common ratio. 
on ratio would be seven on eight. Our first term is one. Yeah. And you guys just need to remember that formula. Or no, it's actually in the data sheet or something like that, right? So we don't have to worry about it too much. So, cool. Okay, so before you lose your mind on everything, right? We've actually established the series yeah. and we've gotten to n minus two. Factorize the one on eight out just so when you apply the geometric series formula, it's a lot, a lot easier. Yeah? And once you have that expression, that expression represents the probability of winning before n's n roll. Right? And the question just asks, hey, can you make that greater than three and four? Apply the inequality, get your final answer. So, if you guys haven't done so already, and the rest is just, you know, and then making sure you guys remember your inequalities. Yeah? No? So find the expression, a finite expression using your series, just so then you can apply it to the inequality. This is three marks, yeah guys? This is three marks, so a lot of working out regardless, but once we get to this point, you will get n greater than 11.38, choose n equals to 12, and then there would be your answer. Roll it 12 times or four 12 times. Move right along with this. And the next one is the next one's just a standard binomial. Like I said, with binomial, you know, some of us find this a bit easier, right? Just, just because there's more reliance on a formula and you're just subbing numbers in for the most part. For the most part, subbing numbers in. Oh, we actually done. So these last two questions, we'll wrap it up. I'll let you guys off. Definitely, if you guys have any further questions, just because I know in a public forum it's a bit hard to ask questions, raise your hand, that's fine, right? If any of these previous questions were a bit difficult or you don't, still don't understand the solutions, just make sure you guys mention it right, after this. We are ending a bit early, so you guys can have a nice break after this. Okay, so with our first binomial question, I feel like you guys can just do this one. It's pretty straightforward, right? You're given, once again, a scenario. I guess uh, you have a total number of things and you want specifically 10, I guess in this case, you have 12, you want specifically, or not specifically, sorry, at least 10. Yeah. Make sure you capture all of that. Yeah. How are we gonna do this? I'll give you a moment. I right. like the super simple question that we went through before. This is still super simple, but it's a bit more work. people in total yeah. and I want at least 10 so I want my R to be 10 I want my R to be 11 R to be 12 right so the binomial formula or the binomial probability you'd have to just apply three times make sure you get everything in this case in this case at least 10 yeah this is not the at least one case where we can just go oh one minus of not getting anything you won't actually get your right answer in that case that is reserved specifically for at least one. Right? So find an expression for the probability that at least 10 people from the group complete the track within eight hours. So the probability, the favorable probability that we have, which we use usually to as P, that's the one that gets to go first, right? Um, is 0.75. Yes. And because we want, or in the first case, for R equals to 10, we want 10 people doing this, yeah? 10 people following this probability. We want 10 of them successful. We'll have uh, 12C and 10, 0 0.75, 10 times, right? So following the branch down 10 times because we need that 10 to occur. And then obviously whatever's left over, the two people that fail is 2, right? Or 12 minus 10. And the probability of failure will just be 0 0.25. And then having the term at the front, we'll just shuffle it around to make sure that you capture every single possibility down the probability tree. That's it. And we can shuffle these around. Forward, full solutions. So make sure you guys get it for, or redo it for 11, redo it for 12, and you'll get your, your final answer. You can kind of see like, I guess the connect, not connection, but the inspiration maybe, from your binomial theorem. theorem. It's like just
expanding your, your uh, binomial expressions. And then the last question. I'll give you guys a minute for the last one if you guys haven't done so already. But it is just probability. Oh, this one's probably a bit more standard. That a particular type of. Oh, they're all one mark each. Yeah. So this one is just basic application. Just don't mess it up on the calculator and you should be fine. Yeah. Find out every single variable that you need for binomial, which is 12. Oh, sorry, which is the n, the r, the two probabilities, or just the one and the complementary. Right? So write an expression for the probability that exactly three of the eight, once again, 8c3. Yeah. Now, we haven't had a chance to cover all types of binomial questions. Just a warning, there are some other types where you'd have to, instead of determining the probability, you're given probability and you have to kind of work backwards to determine the number of times in which something has to happen. Yeah. So that's where you know, logs and stuff will come into play, um, but just uh, be aware of those types of questions as well. Um, not very popular in the HSC, right? With binomial, it's, it's a free mark section. Yeah? Just apply the formula correctly. Think about what you're doing, right? If you have a basic understanding of the, the formula, you should be right. So, with these last ones, everyone done with this, right? What's wrong with this? Very straightforward, everyone cool? So the first one, I want it three times, yeah? So eight, three, or eight choose three, uh, three times of the probability that I actually want, one and five, and then four and five for the rest. And if I want none, apply the same formula, and then one minus, right? One minus will just be the same as before, what we discussed. One minus, oh sorry, at least one will just be one minus. That's, that's it. And that's actually the last question. I'll leave that for you guys up there if you guys need it. But we'll take a break.